This is Duke University. Hello and welcome. Uh, give everyone a chance to take their seats. But uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we have a great speaker. And it is my uh, is with great honor and enthusiasm that I introduce the CEO of Carbon War Room, Jigger Shah. A renowned visionary, Jigger is committed to renewable energy and sustainable solutions that enable prosperity beyond the carbon economy. As CEO of the Carbon War Room, Jigger is dedicated to identifying business as usual practices and replacing them with low carbon solutions. Prior to Carbon War Room, Jigger founded Sun Edison in 2003. Under his leadership, Sun Edison revolutionized the, so the solar industry by introducing a business model to sell solar as a service. This transformation to solar power service agreements is responsible for turning solar services into a multi-billion dollar industry. Jigger is also an expert on energy project finance, changing energy policy, working with entrenched stakeholders, and convincing individuals to embrace energy technology. He works closely with entrepreneurs, policymakers, invest and investors around the world to develop, incubate, and implement sustainable solutions. Jigger holds a BS in, mechanic in mechanical engineering from the um, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and an MBA from the University of Maryland. Jigger sits on the board of the Prometheus Institute for Sustainable Development, SB Now, and Greenpeace USA. So without further ado, and with great privilege, I introduce Jigger Shah. All right, so uh, with that introduction, I'm certainly going to fail. Um, I, I, um, how many people are members of Net Impact? Fantastic. I was, uh, I'm a, I was a member at, at uh, Maryland and, and now a lifetime member. It's a really fantastic organization. So thank you for supporting them. I, um, and, and what am I working with here? Is everyone a FUQA student? All right. What other, what other schools do we have represented here? Nicholas School of the Environment. Fantastic. Anybody else? Mency King Fiber. Oh, fantastic. Private School of Engineering. Oh, great. And what are you studying in engineering? Well, I'm actually in an engineering management program, but I do mechanical. Oh, fantastic. Anybody else? I work for Grow Solar. Oh, great. Jeff Wolf. Yeah, absolutely. Grow's a, Grow's a fantastic story. Anybody else? Any other interesting different majors and different technologies or different people? Great. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, the What I'd like to do is just, given the classroom format of this, I'd love to just encourage you guys to ask questions. And so I'll probably just give some brief remarks and then go into questions. And if you guys are too bashful, then I'll talk some more. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but basically, I, I guess, you know, how many people saw Carbon Nation? Cool movie? Yeah. yeah. Scared half to death? <laughs> so um, the Carbon War Room was started by Sir Richard Branson. Um, and the War Room reference is not a reference to war as much as it's a reference to bringing people together in one place as people talk about, you know, we need to have a war room to bring in the smartest people and figure out how to solve these issues. I think the, in the carbon problem, that's, that's our philosophy. So our, our philosophy is that, in fact, uh, climate change is actually the greatest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. That, in fact, you know, we've been talking about energy waste since Amory Lovins in the 70s and then before that. And we've been talking about um, renewable energy and how, how wonderful it would be if we all powered our homes since the 1970s. And we've been talking about geothermal and, and geothermal heat loops and heat pumps and, and cost-effective air conditioners. And, and, and for whatever reason, we have not been able to scale those technologies. And what we find is, is that, in fact, there's a real reason we haven't been able to scale those technologies, right? And, and, and the reason is generally that, that it, it's a different skill set to, to scale those technologies. I mean, if you were to create you know, something like Facebook or Napster or something like that, what you do is you create it and then you tell everybody about it and then you 
you, you email your friends and then they all download the app and then you guys are done, right? You literally have two million people on something the next day. How hard is it to build two million solar systems on roofs, right? For the folks who are doing solar installations. It's very difficult. Somebody actually has to go to your house and figure out whether it can actually fit. And then they come back with a proposal. You have to cut a check. You actually like then get the permits pulled. There was a study done recently that it costs an average of $2,500 per system in permit costs and engineering costs and all those things. So those are all barriers and friction points. And then, and then after you've done with that, you put the system on the roof and then you get paid the rest of the amount or you get a solar lease or, you know, or a PPA. Um, and, and then what ends up happening is, is like the first cloudy day you get, the customer calls you and says, my system isn't working, what the hell? I paid all this money, well, it's cloudy, dumbass, and, you know, <laughs> so. But you gotta do that, right? I mean, like, you know, and for those of you that are in the solar industry, you know, you actually have to take the phone call. You can't not take the phone call, right? Because you gotta provide customer service. And so, and if the system's down or something else, or you figured out a way to make it a beautiful home for a rat to live in and the inverter, which has happened many times, um, then, you know, you have to actually deal with that. And so, so the challenge is, is that this is what you call infrastructure. Right? Infrastructure is something that actually takes time to maintain. You can't actually just put it together or forget about it. How many people have bought like, you know, um, earphones from, you know, from Best Buy or something and then a week later they didn't work and you just threw them out? Right? How many people have bought like, you know, um, a cell phone and you know, accidentally put it in the bathtub or something and then you just threw it out because whatever, right? You don't throw out a solar system. Right? It's an infrastructure piece. So if something doesn't work on there, you call the guy up and say, hey, where's my warranty? How does this thing work? Right? So that requires infrastructure. And that's, that's just solar right? in, in air conditioning or, or in other places. So for instance, like many buildings like this one have oversized um, air conditioning units. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, one of our early customers at Sun Edison was Staples. And Staples used to tell me that every single store that it had around the country was exactly the same. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. And so, you know, how does it cool the, you know, the store in Arizona? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, it's built for Arizona. So, in fact, in Massachusetts, they have the exact same number of air conditioners on the roof as they have in Arizona. And, and it's because, well, it makes it easier. You know, like, we don't have to make a lot of change orders. We can't trust the construction people to get it right. Well, that's infrastructure, right? They're building buildings, and they've done it exactly the same way because, because for a, a chain like Staples, and Staples is probably one of the most green, sustainable companies in the country, right? That's Staples, you know? And so, so you have this challenge where there's just this massive inertia that just builds up, right? Everyone sort of does things. And the reason they did it that way is because things were cheap, right? At the time in which they made those decisions in the 70s and the 80s, the steel was cheap and aluminum was cheap and, you know, all sorts of things were cheap. Hell, back then even maybe labor was cheap. And so they, able, they were able to get some of that stuff done. Today, it's not so cheap. And what has, has ended up happening is Outside of a little bit of the housing boom, in fact, we haven't built real infrastructure in this country. The number of coal plants that we've built in the night in since 1985 is probably something on the order of around 20,000 megawatts, 25,000 megawatts, which is practically nothing. The the vast majority of the coal plants that we built in this country were built pre-1980, and many of them are pre-1970. Um, and so that a lot of them have to be retired, and about 20 percent to be retired by 2020, and we'll have to figure out what to replace them with. Um, and, you know, and we've made it hard for ourselves, right? So, for instance, Tucson Electric Power decided, you know, they were going to be a good company, and they decided that they were going to make their coal power plant um, co-generation, -gen, co uh, like a uh, combined cycle, all right? So it wasn't just going to be a 34% efficiency plant. They were going to make it a 60% efficiency plant. And for their trouble, Carol Browner said, you know, we're going to sue you for new source review, right? Because you used to be actually exempted from the Clean Air Act rules, but now because you made all these changes to the plant, you're going to have to be subject to new source review. And so that means they had to upgrade another $150 million of the stuff, scrubbers and all sorts of things that they had to put on their plant. And so guess what happened? Not a single company after them has ever made that mistake ever again, right? <laughs> so we have the most inefficient coal fleet in the country. And so, so the challenge is, if this is the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet, how prepared are you guys to actually fill the, fill, fill the void, right? Um, you know, some of the stats were that 50% of all utility um, employees are within 10 years of retirement, right? So that means many of you guys may actually get a job at Duke. I mean, heaven forbid. Um, and so <laughs> if you work at Duke, the question is, is like at, at uh, Duke Energy in this, in this case, um, 
you know, are you prepared for that? I mean, do any of you guys actually know what an independent system operator is, or what the PJM is, or what the Public Utilities Commission is, or how, you know, utilities are actually even regulated? You know, what's the largest water user in, you know, in a non-discretionary source as well, you know, the coal industry? Um, you know, how does, how do you manage water? What do you do for that? I mean, if you're a mechanical engineer, do you actually, you know, study that anymore in fluid dynamics and in, in those other areas? And they don't. And so it's not because you guys have a horrible education. I should hope not. I mean, you're paying enough for it. But, but the, but what you have is a, an entire generation of people that haven't had to bother, right? I mean, there aren't even people that work in your, um, in your city government who know how to do infrastructure, right? I mean, they, the last time you guys built major amounts of new water treatment facilities or major amounts of new, you know, um, you know, water lines and all these other things were a long time ago. Many of the systems in the country are 100 years old, right? And so, for instance, you know, Viola, which is a big French company, says that 45% of all the water in the U.S. actually is unaccounted for, fresh water from wastewater treatment facilities and water companies. They actually have no idea where it goes. Um, it either leaks through pipes or somehow, like, doesn't come back into the wastewater treatment facility. But they're still actually treating all that water. That takes energy, that takes electricity, it takes all these things, and they're treating it. And so, but instead they tell you like, you know, you know, make sure you shut off the faucet when you shave and make sure you shut off the faucet when you brush your, brush your teeth. So one of the things the war room says is that in fact, none of that stuff matters, right? So how many, how many Priuses do you think it takes to save a gigaton of carbon? How many? Throw a number, come on. A million. A million. 300 million. Right? So how many of you guys are making a big difference by buying a Prius? I mean, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't. I mean, I, I, I drove a Prius um, until I gave it to my mother because she rented a car and now I'm carless. But, but um, <laughs> and I'm trying to make that work, but we'll figure that out. Um, I live in D.C., so we do have some public transit there. Um, but, the, um, but it's a big deal. Now, do I want you to not buy a Prius? No. I mean, you should buy a Prius and, you know, if you want to. The, the challenge is, is that we've, we have not that much time left, right? And so if you, if you watch Carbon Nation and you really believe in what they're saying and all these other things, then the question is, is that there's two things. One is, is that how do we actually get the economy back on track? How do we get growth, right? One of the ways to get growth is to eliminate energy waste. Why? Because it doesn't require a balance sheet. We don't actually have to deficit spend um, out of the federal government or out of Raleigh-Durham's budget. I mean, they don't have the money anyway to give you. So, so you can actually eliminate energy waste because it pays for itself. Um, what's stopping it? Well, what's stopping it is, is that everyone has priorities that are more important than eliminating energy waste. Right? If, you, if you run your household and your house is 60 years old, you have bigger priorities than investing in your house. You want to send your kid to college. You want to buy a new car. You want to go on a vacation. So that $20,000 spend to replace all your windows and all these other things never happens to happen. Right? So the reason why solar is taken off is because you can do it without any recourse to you. You can actually put it in. If it saves you $100 a month, you pay $90 a month to the solar leasing company and the other $10 you save, right? So that doesn't exist in energy efficiency. Well, it needs to exist. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. How many of you guys understand project finance? Great. So the challenge with project finance is that it's complicated. What happens in project finance is, you know, I say this guy wants to do energy efficiency in his home. And here's his credit score. Now he's going to say, well, will he sign on the dotted line? Will he give you know, me a pint of blood every month to make sure he pays it back? And, and if he does, then it's just based on FICO score. That's not really project finance. That's credit finance. If, if instead or we do it on a performance basis and we say, well, there's a kilowatt hour meter and it spins. And every time the kilowatt hour meter spins, it produces that's electricity being produced and you pay for that, then that's project finance, right? Because then the investor is taking technology risk. If it doesn't spin, you don't pay. Now, in that case, they say, well, what happens if he moves? What happens if uh, he has um, a baby? What happens if he moves and somebody else comes in and they don't have children? And so they use a lot less energy and then Duke doesn't pay them back for net metering. All of those things that occur are a risk to the investor. So someone actually has to do that. And so we, we at Sun Edison went through reams and reams of paper. And by the time I left, we were on version 37 of the contract. And version 37 of the contract, I'm happy to say, is now financeable globally by many, many people. But it took 37 versions. And I can, I can safely say probably over $5.5 million of the legal fees. So it was a lot of work, right? And so who has the guts to do that, right? So you guys have a choice. You can create an iPhone app and make a lot of money. <laughs> or you can go into the into project finance and infrastructure. 
it's a big it's a big deal, right? In the shipping industry, the work that we did was we found all these technology companies who literally had built these technologies in the nineteen seventies. Asco Nobel is a big company like Dow and Dupont, et cetera. They had these coatings for for ships that uh, made sure that barnacles didn't attach to the bottom of ships, and it would save nine percent of the fuel um, that's burned. Nine percent is a pretty big number, right? And so. Um, just to put it in perspective on a SOx and NOx basis, one of these large ships actually produces the same amount of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides um, as 50 million cars, right? One ship. So big, big acid rain producer, big, big on black soot for, for the Arctic Circle, all these things. Um, and what we realized was that customers were actually paying for the fuel, not the ship owner, right? So they could give a rat's ass. They, if they spent you know, $20 million upgrading their ship, the customer would save all the fuel and they wouldn't get their money back. So um, we said, well, what if the customer demanded it? Well, what we found was when we looked at the shipping industry, in fact, some ships were 20% more efficient than other ships, right? And so, so if Walmart just knew which ships were more efficient than other ships, they would just pick this ship to ship their goods instead of that ship to sh ship their goods, right? And so we published 60,000 uh, data points for ships globally on a website called shippingefficiency.org. And we then rated all of the, um, the ships on a curve. And so the top, like, you know, 7.5% got an A grade, and the next got a B grade, C grade, et cetera. So Walmart could just go to ship owners and say, we're not going to pick the ships. We're just telling you don't, don't use a ship that isn't, is less than A and B grade. Right? And, then, and then ports can do the same thing. And it's predicted to save 450 million tons of carbon by 2020 annually. Right? So that's about 1 34th of what we need to do to save the planet. So um, not too bad. And that, what I would suggest, is far more valuable than getting everybody to figure out a way to buy an LED light bulb. Right? And not to suggest you shouldn't buy one. I've got them and I love them. But they're far better than the compact first light bulbs, I think. But, but in any case, um, it matters, right? Because you guys are super smart people. And if, if I leave the room and all of you guys start selling light bulbs, I'm going to be pissed. Right? I mean, because I don't want the smartest people selling light bulbs. I want the smartest people solving our biggest challenges, our greatest challenges, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's why this stuff matters, and that's why the carbon worm exists. So we believe that all these technologies in 25 different sectors are actually on what we call the left side of the McKinsey cost curve. Um, they're already there, but they're, they're, they're held back because of some sort of market failure. In shipping, it was information asymmetry. In energy efficiency, it's lack of a financial product. Um, to make it off balance sheet. In other cases, it's transaction costs. So for instance, 10% of the world's electricity is produced by diesel, which generates power at 30 to 40, 50, 60 cents a kilowatt hour. In some telecom applications, it's $1.50 a kilowatt hour. And so, but it's hard, because each one of them are 10 kilowatt systems, or some of them are 100 kilowatt systems, and so it's a pain in the ass, and it costs money, and you gotta go in, and so the transaction cost holds it back. So standardization is one way to actually solve that problem. Um, so what I would suggest that you do is to take some of your business school learnings and, you know, and engineering and, and other learnings and look at, um, look at what these market failures are and figure out how you can make a bunch of money solving them. Um, I'll give you one last story about entrepreneurship. Um, so one of our founders is Strive Masiwa, who's one of our donors to the war room. And he's uh, from Zimbabwe. When he was a, at a young age, he somehow got a scholarship and went over to um, the UK to get his engineering degree and then he went over to the US and, um, and got a master's and then went back to Zimbabwe and he worked at the phone company. At the time there was 14 phone lines for every thousand people that, that lived in Africa. Um, and he thought that was a human rights issue, right? And so he went to the court and it took him two and a half, three years and just fought and fought and fought. And lo and behold, I don't know how he did it, but he won. And the court said, you're right, this is a human rights issue, we're going to give you a telecom license. And today he started, you know, what is the largest, uh, one of the largest um, wireless companies in Africa called Econet Wireless. He's worth, you know, several billion dollars and, um, and he does a lot of good stuff in the world. But what he did was not try to make money for himself as an entrepreneur. He tried to solve major problems. And so what I would suggest to you is that there are a lot of major problems to solve, whether it's in the shipping industry, the aviation industry, we can talk about, you know, next gen tra air traffic control, we can talk about the water industry, the power industry. Um, there's many, many places. Sustainable agriculture. I mean, most of you guys have probably seen movies where monoculture is just destroying our topsoil and all sorts of other things. And so there's lots of ways to solve that problem. Sustainable forestry. There's tons of things you can do, but use your brain to solve a problem. And once you've solved that problem, make a, make a ton of money off of it. 
you know, it's good. And then you can have one of these schools named after you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so at that, at there, what's, I'd love to hear questions. The, the speaker just before you uh, is a banker from Houston, oil and gas guy. Very much the uh, focus of his talk was he sees us turn into a natural gas, or he sees natural gas as a player. And I wonder if you could just speak to the impact of natural gas from your perspective on renewables, renewable development, uh, and as you see that going forward. Yeah, so it's um, a good question. Did everybody hear the question? Okay. Um, I think that there, there's a couple ways to think about this first. First, renewable energy is a global industry. <coughs> Right? So while some of the folks in this room that install solar um, on, on roofs may go out of business if North Carolina changes this subsidy or that subsidy or, or natural gas gets cheap and they can't sell it anymore because the reference price is too low, the renewable energy industry itself is not affected globally. Right? I mean, in fact, you've got huge amounts of solar going into India now and Thailand and into, into South Africa, Uganda just passed a huge feed-in tariff. And so, in fact, globally, you're actually seeing huge amounts of growth regardless of what happens on a micro basis for natural gas and some of these other things. So that, that's one point. So in fact, the cost curves for renewables continue to come down regardless of what's happening in the microclimate. In terms of the US, I mean, when I used to work at BP, we were the largest natural gas producer in the US. And I'm, I'm assuming we still are, but I don't, I don't remember uh, now. But, but what, what you find out the natural gas industry is they are by far the weakest business people in the country. Like, it is, it is god awful at how bad these guys are. And, and the reason for that is not because they're dumb. It's because natural gas is, is, a, is a crappy fuel, right? So the problem with natural gas is that when you drill a natural gas well, in fact, the declination rates of a natural gas well is about 50% a year until it hits to some asymptotic line and then produces about 10% of what it originally started at for 20 years, right? And so you don't make money drilling for natural gas. The only reason you make money is because there's a thing called the intangible drilling credit which makes, it basically pays for all of your drilling costs for natural gas. And when I was talking to T. Boone Pickens about this, he was saying to me that in fact, if you got rid of the intangible drilling credit, that you know 35% of all the natural gas drilling in the country would stop. Because uh, it just wouldn't be cost effective for most of the people to do it. So that's one thing, is to understand the natural gas itself is actually a hugely subsidized fuel. And it's not subsidized based on BTUs, it's subsidized based on risk, right? Because if I went to you and I said, I've got this great geological survey, I'm gonna, you know, I want a million dollars to drill it. You might get a 25% rate of return if I find gas, but you lose all your money if I don't. But because of the intangible drilling credit, you get all your million dollars back through credits if I don't find gas, and you still get a 25% upside if I do find gas, right? And so that's why they drill. And it's a big problem, and it's something that's under assault all the time. And so, so that's the first point there. The second point is that natural gas is generally dominated by wildcatters. And so you've got all these crazy lunatics that go out there and actually drill for natural gas and don't care about you know, the wastewater and you know, like hydrofracking fluids and all the other pieces. And so I guarantee you today, hopefully this is being recorded, so you can actually quote me on it. Um, you know, like I guarantee you that within six years' time, the Pennsylvania watershed will be polluted. And me and DC will have to drink, drink bottled water. At the time at which that happens, they are going to get overregulated and natural gas prices will go up again. So I don't actually think it's a big deal. In fact, I think natural gas is a fantastic thing for the renewable energy industry because it's actually the reason we're going to defeat coal, right? Because right now, coal and natural gas are going at loggerheads like crazy. About 7% of all the coal burn in the US has shifted to natural gas um, in the last two years. And so I think this is fantastic. The natural gas guys are going to beat up the coal guys, and the coal guys are going to beat up the natural gas guys, and they're just going to go bloody. And all, all along the way, like solar and wind and all those technologies keep coming down in cost because it's a global commodity. Um, and so I, I actually think it's going to be just fine. The, the last point I make on natural gas is that um, there's a distinction between wind and solar. Um, solar is a distributed generation technology. So in most utility companies, generation is less than 50% of the cost of what you pay at the, at the retail um, bill. The other costs are transmission distribution, mistakes the utility made a long time ago, SGNA, <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? And those things keep going up. And so even, even with wholesale prices have fallen about 60% in the PJM, um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, um, in, independent system operator, and electricity rates have stayed roughly the same because they've had to raise rates so much to pay for new distribution lines and that kind of stuff. And so, so solar actually competes with retail rates, not wholesale rates. And so it's, it's largely unaffected by 
by the natural gas fee. So I don't actually think it's a big deal, and I know everybody wants it to be a big deal, but but it's not a big deal. Natural gas prices have already started creeping up. Um, so any other questions? Sure. So you talked about um, entrepreneurship. Uh, do you see more mature companies, kind of Fortune 500 companies, taking a bigger role in, uh, in clean tech, or do you see smaller uh, startups taking a bigger role in the next um, few years? It's both, and, and you should be very careful about the distinction. So if, if you're an independent power company, right, a power producer, like NRG mm -hmm. is a big one, or um, Florida Power and Light's unregulated subsidiary, or some of these other folks like that, Exelon's got an unregulated subsidiary, those guys actually don't care, right? Solar, wind, coal, natural gas. If you generate a 12% after tax you know, return on equity, they're investing. And if, if they don't, they don't, right? So those guys don't care. And, and so, and actually right now, it's pretty easy to get a 12% after tax return. So they're investing like crazy, right? NRG just committed, I think, 1.5 billion to that deal that for solar's doing and that kind of stuff. For the regulated utility, I think it's almost impossible to see them actually getting involved in any major way, right? Whether it be Duke Energy or Progress or you know, or the PSENG in New Jersey or some of these other major utilities that are regulated. And the challenge is, is not because they're dumb. I mean, I, I've had long conversations with these guys and they're really smart people, right? And, but the challenge is, is that they, they, you know, what's amazing to me about, about CEOs in general, everybody wants to call them masters of the universe and they get paid $30 million salaries and all this other stuff. But they're literally, they live in a box. It's so sad, you know, like, it, like in general, like, you know, when you go to these guys, everyone says, well, it's their board. Their board is, like, totally screwing them, right? They won't let them do it. But the fact is the board of, of these utility companies represent institutional shareholders, right? And those institutional shareholders actually buy utility stock for a reason, right? They say, it's super safe, and I get a 7% or 8% dividend every year, right? So they don't want them to do anything interesting and unique or different. In fact, what you find with the utility companies who own a lot of generating assets, the regulated ones, is they generally wait till a bankruptcy cycle, right? So like when, when Enron exploded and all those natural gas you know, units were like left over, Southern Company bought them at 10 cents on the dollar and all these other people bought them at 10 cents on the dollar. So that's usually how they buy these things. They generally are not these like sort of forward thinking people. And, and it's not because, like I said, it's not because they're dumb or they're not capable of being forward thinking. It's that they're, they're stuck in rigid frameworks that don't really let them. And you know, like one last point, like on that is, for instance, you know, when I was at BP, the biggest problem that these oil companies have, and everybody wants them to become energy companies, um, is that they get they get rated on replacement reserve, um, you know, reserve replacement ratio, right? So if they drill a million barrels a day on the ground, they've got to find a million barrels a day that year, and that's the calculation. When um, John Brown bought Amoco in 1998, in fact, it took him the entire year to convince Wall Street to include natural gas in reverse. Reserve replacement ratio, right? Today, ExxonMobil gets about seventy percent of its reserve replacement ratio from natural gas. So, like, it's only been like thirteen years since they actually even allowed natural gas to be counted in them. There's, they have no idea how to count wind and solar into reserve replacement ratio, and that's what they get grilled on. Like, you know, most of these institutional investors could give a rat's ass what their earnings are because they just figure their earnings are a function of how much reserves they have, right? So, so. I don't actually ever see these big oil and gas companies being the leaders in, in renewable energy because even though I can prove, and I have proven, um, that on a risk-adjusted basis, it's more cost-effective for them to invest in these other assets, particularly like someone like BP, right? I mean, it's been widely, widely like, you know, said now that BP was central to getting that prisoner out of Scotland for Libya, right? Because it needed the contracts in Libya, and the Libyan said, we're not going to give you the contract unless you actually free the prisoner. And so, you know, when you've got that much power to do these kind of things, I mean, they could easily, like, build 4,000 megawatts of solar in Libya at the same time, right? I mean, it's not that hard, right? And, then, and, and the Germans actually want the power. They're willing to pay through the nose for it. That's the whole Desert Tech, you know, project, right? So they could, the biggest value that BP has is actually their ability to get, you know, like President Obama on the phone whenever they want to, or, you know, or, the, you know, or David Cameron from the UK. And they don't really use it for, for good. They use it for whatever they do it for. So, um, so it's, I don't really see them being leaders. And so for all those guys who say, join our renewable energy group, you're totally like, you know, going to be stifled in there. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, so once you've identified a market failure in one of your 25 sectors of interest and you've designed a policy solution or, or a solution, 
how do you implement it? Like the shipping example seemed pretty straightforward and easy to implement, but are there other sectors where actually implementing the solution is tricky? Yeah, well, first of all, my sense is that the people who actually implemented the shipping solution won't think it was straightforward or simple. Okay. Um, <laughs> we had some smart people that worked on that. But, um, but what I would say is, is we, we focus almost, well, actually, we do. We focus entirely on non-policy related solutions. Um, it's not because we don't believe in policy. I mean, I think um, the, folk that, the folks that work in policy are you know, fantastic guys, and, and they, they deserve credit for what they do. But we think that that's a fairly crowded space, and that, that in fact, there's a lot of people trying to pass a climate bill or a renewable portfolio standard in North Carolina or, or you know, enhance this or that or whatever it is. And so, so our sense is that there's actually market failures. I mean, if something actually saves money right now, then there, so we, we see it as a as, as three-legged stool, right? So you've got policy that matters, particularly in infrastructure where you know it's all sort of you know top-down sort of uh, regulated, and then um, you have you have technology which matters, right? They have to actually meet technical milestones. And at BP, I remember we we had to have a hundred thousand hours of test data in the field in one location before it was deemed mature. So that's twelve years, right? So so you need like technology that's gone through twelve years of testing, um, and then then you know, the problem is capital, right? The third leg of the stool is capital. So if we only work on things where we think that the policy is accommodative enough, given that the technology is already left side of the cost curve, and yet capital still doesn't flow. So in energy efficiency, we're working on um, creating these financial structures um, to move forward in, in other places, the things. But, but the amount of gigaton scale um, climate reduction potential in each of the sectors varies widely, right? So, Wildly, like so. For instance, in um, in aviation, those guys are actually really well aligned with uh, with fuel savings, and so their carbon footprint is as low as they really can do it without like big big changes. So one of the big things that they could do is air traffic, um, the next generation air traffic control, where they can move planes closer together <coughs> and they can actually do continuous rapid descent. So about fifteen percent of fuel is burned um, on the descent of an airplane because every five thousand feet the air traffic controllers make them stop because they're their air traffic control really is in two dimensions. It's that sort of black thing with rings on it. And they have like, you know, your airplane with 5K next to it. So they know what, what elevation you're at. And so if they could do continuous rapid descent, that they could save like 15% of the fuel, which is big, right? And then you've got renewable fuels that, you know, could get there um, and is getting there, but that's, a, that's still not on the left side of the cost curve. Um, so, so I think that, I, I think in some areas we have huge potential. In other areas, we have more limited potential. So we focus on the ones we have huge potential on and wait to the limited potential ones later. So where do you see solar going in the future in terms of uh, DC going towards mostly distributed generation or possibly to utility size projects? Well, either way, it's going to be too cheap to meter. Um, no. Um, <laughs> it'll, it'll never be too cheap to meter. Um, I think. Um, well, you know, my, it's a very difficult question for, for me to answer um, sort of, you know, just unbiasedly because I've been Mr. Distributed Generation for years. So um, I clearly think distributed generation is the way to go. If you look at Bavaria, for instance, right now, they, they, ins they installed 78 gigawatts last year alone in Bavaria, which is a tiny portion at the bottom, which is, might be the size of, you know, like California or something. Um, actually, far less, I think it's. Much, much smaller than California. So, so it's, it's a tiny region, right? And they still didn't run on rooftops. I mean, there's, there, there's plenty of space. Um, and my sense is, is that distributed generation, the studies in Denmark and Japan and other places show that distributed generation from cogeneration, not just solar, um, is far more robust for utility or for grid um, reliability. So it's, it's kind, kind of odd in the US how everybody says, well, you know, I think Duke said one time, like, well, you know, we don't. We think at three percent penetration, the grid will go down or something, um, which is complete crap. And I remember, like, they had to rescind it and have to, have to because you know people called them on their bluff. But, but, um, but people are easily scared in the U.S. It's like, well, the grid's gonna go down. You're gonna, you know, do the thing. I've had like five days of power outages already in D.C. So, like, it seems like it's happening already. <laughs> uh, but uh, and, and we don't have a lot of solar on the grid yet. So. So I think it's going to be distributed generation, and, and mostly because I think you're fighting with retail costs there. Um, you know, on, on utility scale, you're really fighting wholesale costs. So it's really hard for solar to ever say it's cost competitive with with wholesale other wholesale alternatives, even though I think it is based on life cycle costing. But um, on distributed generation, we can show that it's cost effective for about fifteen percent of the U.S. population today without any state incentives. So.
Do you think um, financial institutions today are capable of driving innovation and energy and efficiency, or do they need a lot of fresh you know, thinking to be coming up with these new assets? You know, the funny thing is I was talking to one of your professors um, today about this, and I, I actually, so if, if those are your two choices, it's they need fresh thinking. Um, but my sense is that I don't actually think that the investment banks in general um, make money on infrastructure anymore. I mean, I think that they just, they find, they find the process of money raising is where they make money. So to the extent that we allow master lease part, master limited partnerships and real estate investment trusts to be used to do this, they'll, they'll be huge friends of ours because they'll make 6% on everything they raise in, 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 in the public markets. But doing straight up project finance like Backpack and Brown used to do and like some of these other groups used to do, that's just not their bailiwick. So my sense is that the financial community is just gonna, you're gonna have boutique folks who actually just focus on project finance. And you're seeing that now. Like, I mean, Sun Edison, even today, actually doesn't use anybody. It goes directly to the insurance companies and the banks and those that get money from primary sources of capital. Um, there's private equity sources that have actually put funds together that, that are you know, investing in renewable energy, but none of the investment banks have made any money on raising that money. It's all you know, three principals that have walked around with all the family offices and you know, gotten them to put, put money in. So I, I used to complain loudly about it and said, you know, you know this sucks. And, and I remember like, uh, I was talking to Goldman the other day, and, and I was saying, you know, you guys laid off almost everybody in the projects finance division in 2008. And, and, you know, and they sort of argued with me, and then they finally said, yeah, you're probably right. You know, we probably did. And you know, Morgan Stanley, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, they've all laid off most of their project finance people. Um, but the thing is, they don't make a lot of money on project finance. And so they'd rather make you know, derivative products that high frequency trading products, where they make like you know, 0.4% a day. And, you know, that's a pretty good rate of return on their money over the year. So, and I don't fault them for it. But there's other boutiques that are taking it over. So the boutiques will take it over. Um, for large scale generation of renewable energy, obviously one of the big barriers is transmission, like you already mentioned. What do you think it's going to take to crack that nut to make it happen? Because it seems like there's a lot of folks who are not interested in investing in that at large scale right now. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one thing that could work is communism, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think transmission is permanently dead. I mean, it's, it's so easy to kill transmission lines, right? I mean, like if you're a governor and you're trying to go for re-election, you know, and you're putting a, a transmission line through some rich neighborhood, I go to all those rich people and go, hey, did you support the governor? Yes, I did. Could you actually write him a letter saying to screw off if he actually builds this transmission line? Yes, I can. And then, you know, it's dead. And so it's, it's fairly easy to kill transmission lines. I think the, the one place where it could actually improve is American Superconductor, you know, God bless them, you know, has been doing their stuff for God knows, like 25 years, I think, right? This is a company, a little engine that could. Um, you know, in 1998, I think they went public and they finally got their first order like four months ago. Um, you know, so, so, you know, South Korea just bought their, bought their lines and I think it, I think it holds like 100 times the capacity of electricity than a normal copper transmission line. So that's pretty easy to see you doing. Like if you just restrung existing transmission lines, then you could do it. But you know, I, I don't know. I've, I've, the, the challenge with this stuff is it's, it is either or, right? Everybody wants it to be both. Like all of my friends in the room, I just say, why you so, why you got to make it black or white? Because it is black or white. I find the people that are shades of gray are the people who are just cop outs. And so, so, you know, like the problem is, is that let's say you want to do a utility scale project. That's great, right? Now you go into the utility queue and there's no, no space in the transmission line. Now they have to fund it, right? So the way they do it is they actually put it on the cost of the generator, which makes it uneconomic. Um, in California, they tried to fix it by making it, you only have to bear your portion of the transmission costs and so they can spread it among all these people. Um, but it's a lot of work. I mean, like, you know, it, pg e put all these contracts out, what, in 2007 or so? Some of these big Chinese companies are finally buying those contracts from people that are gone out of business or are not doing that well. And, and they're actually saying to build a project. In the meantime, like you've got Solar City and Sunrun and Grow Solar and everybody else going to town on all these like, you know, residential rooftops and other things. And, you know, the thing is, is that people like that better, right? Like I love giving the utility the middle finger, right? I'm like, you know, you charge me way too much for power. 
Therefore, I'm going to generate my own power and have a $0 bill. My brother is in um, Martinez, California, and he has a negative $730 credit, basically, on his bill right now. And he loves it. He like shows all of his friends, and he's like, look at this. This is awesome. You know? And you can't do that from a utility-scale solar power plant. So you know, I'm not anti-utility solar scale, but I, but I do think that um, it doesn't make as much sense. And I think the other problem is, like, Tucson Electric Power did this big study, which actually does scare the bejesus out of me, where they took their Springerville system, and one cloud went overhead, and it literally, like, dropped the voltage and the frequency on the line by, like, a huge amount. So you have to put battery storage in. Whereas when, when you do the modeling work in communities in California that have tons of solar, one cloud has no impact on distributed generation in terms of, you know, quality of the grid. So, I don't know. You're still going to get some, but my prediction that I've made on the record is that utility-scale solar will never surpass distributed-scale solar on an annual basis. So. So, I guess, building off that question and that answer, at some point in time, I definitely agree with you that with the idea of distributed generation, but there has to be some sort of base load. So, I'm wondering what... You know, where do you see baseload generation going in the future if it's not, if transmission is such an issue and, you know, we, you still have a lot of coal to replace? And... Well, who, who has an engineering degree in the room? Have you guys ever taken a class to describe baseload power? That actually used the word baseload power? Because yeah. when, when I did my class, that, did, that word didn't exist in the textbooks. It's actually invented by the press. There's no such thing as baseload. When you go to, like, a coal plant and actually run a coal plant, it's got a 74% capacity factor. You don't actually know when the 26% outage is gonna happen. Like it happens randomly, they like sort of do it, and then, you know, sometimes it got scheduled outages, but they're always offline for whatever reason. And so you actually have a number of like alternative sources, you know, peaker plants and, you know, all these other things that, that are online just in case. Um, and so I don't think the concept of baseload actually exists. You know, there is a concept of, of, of you know, of, of power plants that are actually, you know, can be turned on at any time during the day. Um, but that this whole concept of baseload, you know, except for nuclear, I don't see any plants that actually run, you know, all year at ninety plus percent capacity factors. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing, though, is that, I mean, that's the beauty of the internet and 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 with you know with cheap telecommunications now, right? I mean, <coughs> baseload just means that basically we've got to make power supply equal power demand at all times, right? And so if you can gang all these power plants together in a virtual network with, you know, Google software or whatever it is, um, you can actually be, you know, real time changing demand as well as changing supply to make sure that they're equal. I mean, today, Enernoc has, I think, 1500 megawatts of demand response that they control on the PJM grid, right? And so, you know, if, if you need to actually protect the grid, you, you know, you, you do this and all these corporations get paid to do that, right? Um, in places like you know, North Carolina or in uh, Colorado, in fact, the peak, because of air conditioning loads, is double the off-peak. So they actually have coal plants that they can't shut down because they're baseload, and, um, and they don't really you know, ramp down. So they ramp them down to 70% and they shunt the power to ground. So they, they, they actually burn coal and shunt the power to ground. They're too dumb to create hydrogen with it or something else, you know, and so they just shunt it. And that's just sad, right? I mean, and so... So that happens all the time. And so then when Duke says to me, well, Jigger, we're going to build this coal power plant in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm like, great. You know, like, so is it going to run 24 hours a day, 70 days a week? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And then so when you look at their grid, they actually have, you know, I don't know if you know how the dispatch curve works under PGM, but, you know, this coal plant actually doesn't meet the minimum dispatch curve, you know, like at the, the lowest demand point. And so, in fact, like, it won't be able to sell power something on the order of like 35% of the time. Um, into the grid because it'll be too expensive um, on the dispatch curve. So, so, so when they tell you it's going to be like seven or eight, I think now it's nine cents a kilowatt hour for this thing. That doesn't include the fact that thirty-five percent of the time it won't run. So it's actually more like fourteen to fifteen cents a kilowatt hour for that new coal plant, and that's atrocious. I mean, like that's. I mean, it's it's and so there's no such thing as baseload. I mean, that's this whole mythical thing, and and you actually have the ability to. I mean, the other thing for me is that you know everyone loves solar and and. Thank goodness they do, because you know I made some money on it. But, but the thing is, is that there's 50 gigawatts of cogeneration capacity that we don't do because the utilities find it inconvenient to drop standby charges and other things that you know prevent it from making economic sense. And cogeneration is like waste heat recovery, right? It's like four to five, six cents a kilowatt hour to generate that power. I just find it sad that they don't like do cogeneration. I mean, that's just 
I mean, that, that would be a great way to actually solve this big problem. So yeah, don't be fooled by the utility and base load. <laughs> Any other questions? How does uh, China expand without massive carbon emissions? Ooh, look at you throwing the tough curveball question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think that it's going to be tough, right? I mean, so that's why that's why China has pushed for carbon intensity targets, but not carbon absolute carbon re reduction targets. So, in China, the challenge is that if you have GDP growth of ten percent, but then they only have a carbon reduction carbon intensity target reduction of like four percent a year. Well, then, in fact, their net carbon emissions are going up every year. And it's, it's not an easy thing to fix. I think um, one of the things that's in our favor is that China's paying through the nose for coal, right? So its latest coal contract for, with Australia is $115 a ton, um, which is a very expensive coal plant. And, and, um, and so they're actually, they're actually, you know, they're at capacity in terms of their own coal capacity. So they clearly have coal, but in terms of the amount of coal that they can actually mine out of the ground and actually shift efficiently using their rail system, which is bottlenecked. Um, they can't actually use any more coal than they're already using from their own domestic sources. So all their new coal plants are building on the water so that they can bring coal in from outside and actually just power directly from the port. Um, but you know, it's a pain in the ass, right? I mean, like, you know, if you're paying $115 and then Australia just said that they look like they're gonna screw them, right? Because of the big floods in Australia, they're saying some of the mines just got flooded out and so it's gonna take them two years to actually get the mines back up and running. And they're saying, you know, we prefer ourselves first over you. So, you know, so it looks like they're gonna get screwed on some of the capacity there. And you know, the thing, the biggest challenge I see with China that way is that, you know, I don't know if you followed what happened when oil went to $147 a barrel in 2008, but you know, a lot of people started calling eminent domain, right? Like. Venezuela was like, hey, that refinery you built for us, that's mine. And you know, <laughs> Russia was like, that's mine. And so all these people started to do that, right? And so which is why the oil companies actually don't want oil prices to go up that much. That's why they're pushing alternatives and okay with all this other stuff. Because at the time at which oil price goes to $200 a barrel, a lot of people are going to say, hey, Angola was a friendly place to do it, but not anymore. And that's all our money, right? So, so I think the same thing is going to happen with coal. I mean, you know, if, if they start over mining Mozambique and you know, some of these other places, Mozambique's gonna say, hey, wait a second, like, you know, all you gave us was this, like, stupid road and these stupid railway tracks and, like, we're taking off our coal for free? No way, you know, like, we're gonna take that coal back and we can eminent domain it, right? So, I think China sees that as a huge problem. And actually, in, for India, it's far worse, right? Because in India, their, the quality of their coal is so god-awful that they actually have to get most of their coal from Indonesia and Mozambique and other places. And so, Montak Singh, who's their head of their planning board, has said, you know, publicly many times, like, We've got to get off of coal because um, we just we just they are going to have a national security problem um, with coal. So it's not a simple answer to your question. Obviously, I mean they're they're building as much solar and wind and other stuff as they can, but they're not blessed. Um, it's the rising sun. They don't actually have sun. Oh, that's sick. That's Japan. So it's <laughs> well, what's what's China anyway? But they they don't they don't seem to have a lot of like sunlight in China. I mean, Western China has sun, but Eastern China, where everyone lives, is just like blacked out from pollution the whole time, um, smog and stuff. So I don't know the answer to your question. All I know is that it's a big problem and people that are way smarter than me, like you know the other environmental groups and others are working on that problem. But China itself feels um, like it's a big problem that they have to solve for what it's worth. In the same vein, can you speak to energy and carbon, especially in developing nations? and? Um, if there's a chance where transmission is not very sophisticated or maybe non-existent, and how that technology change is going to look there, if there's a chance to leapfrog like a traditional technology like coal or something and straight to renewables, or how do you see that playing out? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough an, a question to answer. So like Cameroon, for instance, right, has La Pangora, which is a big you know dam that they're trying to build. It's five billion dollars, and the World Bank wants to fund and. All that power basically goes to Alucan and Rio Tinto to process aluminum for France, and it's like 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour they're paying when the Cameroon people are paying like 14 cents a kilowatt hour for power. Um, and 70% of the people in Cameroon don't have access to electricity. Yeah. So, um, but they, you know, it doesn't seem to bother the World Bank. Um, so, you know, they're going strong. But I think the challenge is, is that people in rural areas really believe that non grid power is inferior to grid power, right? And so, so you can give them like solar home systems and microgrids and all sorts of other stuff. 
it actually works beautifully. And today it's um, like, for instance, throughout Africa and India, there's about 150,000 telecom towers in each place that are powered by diesel. And most of these places are in rural areas. And so, you, in fact, you can just power the telecom tower and then oversize it and then just, you know, power the people around it because most of them are in fairly, like, sort of in villages. Um, so there are lots of technical ways to solve the problem. And there's and one of the things we're working on is financial ways to solve the problem, which are actually, frankly, not that hard. Um, but the problem is this personal, you know, sort of preference problem. A lot of people think, oh, you're giving me a microgrid. That, that means I'm at the bottom of the list to get the grid when it actually comes around. Um, and it's a tough thing to solve. I, I, my sense is that that's getting better. I mean, there's companies like Barefoot Power and others who are selling... Um, extraordinary quantities of solar lanterns and solar floodlights and all these other things. And there's a bunch of people doing this work and it's getting better and better. A lot of people are sort of, you know, reducing the stigma and I'm hoping that that gets better. But it's not like they're going to actually power these people. They actually give, you know, could give a rat's ass. So, so the finance side, are you using like micro loans and micro financing or is it? Yeah. So they're using micro loans, which is a big problem. And so the problem with microfinance broadly is it has huge transaction costs. So the interest rates on microfinance loans, when you fig figure in all the fees and stuff, are over 30%. And so, um, and they're not gouging those people. It just costs a lot of money to collect the money every week, right? And so um, I think the big hope there is that we go to, like, mobile banking. Because, you know, 70% of people in Africa now have mobile phones. And so you can use mobile banking, like uh, M-Pasa is done in Kenya and those kind of things. And so, and that reduces transaction costs way down. So you can get to, you know, 12 13% interest financing. And so I actually think there's a solution there, but it's, um, my sense is it's going to come from the telecom towers. I mean, I think this is sort of this backward way of doing it, is you power all the telecom towers, which are easy to do because you've got big credit worthy entities that are actually, you know, paying for the diesel at like 75 cents a kilowatt hour. And then you, um, and then you oversize it and you probably do battery swapping technologies first, like, um, the company in, uh, Dar es Salaam that does this, it's, a uh, I forgot the name, but anyway, they egg E G G or something. They won the business case competition at MIT or something, and they basically they they have people with motorcycle batteries. They come in, they charge them, they take them home, and they power their stuff, and they come back and they charge it again, and, and they do that kind of thing. And you can do that right at the telecom site. And then once you addict people to, you know, using electricity to make their lives a little easier. I mean, women, you know, one of the biggest causes of women um, dying prematurely in those areas are black carbon in their lungs from kerosene and, and candles and stuff. So once you once you get them addicted to cleaner sources of energy, then they're gonna be like, well, you know, this battery swapping thing is a pain in my ass. I'd rather have a solar home system at home or something like that. So not an easy answer, but hopefully it's an answer that answers your question. Uh, did you have a question? My question was about methane in terms of like as, as it relates to agriculture. Is that how, how do you do that problem? Is that significant? Uh, oh it's sure. I mean yeah. it's definitely you mean in terms of like plowing plowing it over and then having methane come out of the ground, like right, no-till. You know, and, and from animals as well, right? Yeah. Um, well, the thing with animals is it's actually an easier problem to solve. It's, you know, we're feeding animals stuff that they actually can't process. And so we actually, you know, we just have to feed them stuff that they can process. Um, you know, animals can't eat corn, but they are forced to eat corn, and it gives them gas and provides methane. So, and, um, and so we just have to solve the problem. And it's actually, you know, if you read Michael Pollan's book, like, it's actually better for us not to eat stuff that's like um, the meat that's made there. So um, I, I don't know. It seems like that's catching on. Maybe I'm just being overly, you know, like optimistic about that stuff. Um, so on the methane side, you know, we just got to figure out a way to, you know, go to more free range options. I mean, the New Zealanders have actually cut their emissions from methane by like 75% already just by changing the diet of, of the, the cows and, you know, and some of the species that they're using. So it's it's clearly possible. We just have to figure out a way to get it done. Um, in terms of general agriculture, so one of the one of the big things is biochar, um, and so you take all the no-till um, waste and you actually you know you actually you know burn it through pyrolysis and you create biochar, which is like a soil, right? It's like um, terra preta soils in, in the Amazon and stuff, and um, and it it has huge like economic benefits. You know, some of the data shows that like strawberries are up. 80% when you put them in the soil and tomatoes are up like 35% or something. And so it's a huge rate of return to farmers actually to use this stuff. But, you know, like anything, it's, it's inertia. And so we have to work 
harder to you know fight inertia and and the biochar companies are pretty immature right now and so they're slowly getting more and more mature and so i think that there's there's ways of solving the problem there's also folks who do a waste energy type stuff which is you know uh, far better from a carbon footprint perspective than letting it decay into methane um the bigger challenge with methane to tell you the truth is natural gas um you know some of the studies i've seen more recently is that they used to um, assume that only 2% of the gas leaked through the pipelines, and it's actually more like 4%. And that makes it actually just as bad as coal in terms of you know, CO2 impact, so equivalent. So because methane is like 22 times worse than CO2. And so it's, um, that's the big challenge I see on the methane side. But agriculture is a big deal, and we have this Creating Climate Wealth Summit that we run every year. And this year it's May 3rd and 4th, and we've got a whole track on sustainable agriculture. Because some of the things that's interesting that you can do is... Um, there are companies now that build greenhouses on top of um, grocery stores. And a lot of the water-heavy vegetables, they just grow in those greenhouses and then sell directly to the store below. And it saves huge amounts of money. It's like 70% of the cost of these water-heavy vegetables is transportation cost. And so it actually saves a bunch. And so you actually, it's cheaper to make and it's a much higher rate of return. And it's 95% less water usage. And it's no you know, pesticides and fertilizer and you know, all that stuff. So there's some innovation, but it's slow coming. So back to the issue of, the, of developing countries, do you think the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol is working in delivering transfer of technology? Uh, uh, do you think it's working? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard bad rumors about that, but I just um, wanted to have your opinion. I mean, I, I, I think people are quite serious about their intentions with the CDM process, but the challenge with CDM is you've got you know Japan that's buying CDM offsets, um, you've got Norway that's buying CDM offsets. You've got a certain amount coming out of the EU ETS. And, you know, when you add all that stuff up, it's like two gigatons total of CDMs. So that's like 200 million tons a year for the next 10 years, which is, you know, just absolutely nothing, you know. And, and so the challenge is, is that, so there's two challenges. One is, is that the CDM process um, is small, right? That's one challenge. Um, and gained by the Chinese and lots of other folks. Um, the other challenge with the CDM process, it's not a lot of money, right? So if you're Guatemala and you're like, I'm a small country, you know, and, and I want to do all this stuff, well, you got to do all the certification work, all this stuff to get qualified to do CDMs, and then it's not that much money. And, like, and, and they don't allow for negative carbon. So if you, actually, if you actually did negative carbon in Guatemala, you can't get credit for it, right? And so if, what if you were able to suck down a gigaton of carbon because you had some sort of natural you know, formation that you could actually, you know, store the carbon into or you figure out some other way to suck, suck it down naturally, like, you know, tree planting or whatever else, you don't get any value for that. And so I, I think the challenge of CDMs is it's a great experiment, which is good, um, but it just doesn't seem to scale, the gigaton scale. For the carbon war room, if we can't get to 17 gigatons of carbon reduction off the baseline by 2020, then, you know, we're not, we're not working hard enough. Speaking of sucking down carbon, um, what is your thoughts on CCS, both from a perspective of the you know power sector and then also the industrial sector? You know when and if do you see that coming to fruition? Well, so CCS, I mean, there's there's a couple of things, right? One is there's a very cost-effective form of CCS, which is you know to pump it into oil wells to get better pressure, right? And so they do that already. And to the extent that you have carbon you know, <coughs> handy. Um, you know, people do that all the time because it's much better than pumping air down, um, down, down the, down the well. So, so that's cost effective. I mean, I've heard some people talk about like, you know, Coca-Cola actually like trying to build their plants next to these things. But the challenge with Coca-Cola is that the taste of Coca-Cola actually depend solely on the water that's there and the water around coal plants sucks. So like, <laughs> it's very difficult to sort of match the two. Um, as lo along with Coors Beer, by the way, um, they were one of our huge, hugest allies in, Colorado because they care so much about how the water tastes. Um, the, um, so the challenge with CCS broadly is that um, I'm 100% sure it's going to work. Like, I mean, technically, I have full faith in, in my brethren in the engineering community to actually figure this out. So I have no doubts that they can figure it out. The challenge it is, is, is very similar to the comment that I made around you know, utility-scale solar versus distributed generation solar, right? So, so if, if you have a coal plant today that's you know, let's call it 1,000 megawatts, and it was built in 1982. Well, the new mercury rules, the new coal fly ash rules, you're going to have to spend another $100 million to actually upgrade the plant to deal with the mercury regulations and that regulation, right? So that's step one. 
And then step two is now you got to put, you know, CCS, which is another expense, right? And then, and then, you know, and CCS is a double expense, right? Not only does it cost money to put in, but it actually steals power from the power plant, so it actually has less power to sell um, um, because it takes power to, to run it. So after you've netted all that stuff out and the fact that coal and wind and all this stuff is getting cheaper and all the CCS people, even the people who are their biggest proponents, are saying it's not going to be ready for commercial, full commercialization until 2025, um, you're like, do we, are we really going to need the CCS in 2025 or is it going to be better just to like let that stuff run and just keep putting in more renewables and that kind of stuff because um, you have to amortize that cost the reason people are so obsessed with ccs is they think that china is going to have to do ccs because its coal plants are so new that they're not going to want to mothball them in the u.s most of them will get mothballed because you know if you know most of them are end of life by 2030 anyway and so unless they build new coal power plants which you know there's a lot of people that are making sure that doesn't happen um my sense is that CCS in the U.S. will be difficult outside of huge pilot programs. And you sort of need those pilot programs, right? That's how you buy the votes in Congress necessary to actually pass it through. I'll, I'll just be fast enough. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just was hoping you could say what CCS stands for. Oh, uh, <laughs> carbon, carbon capture and storage. Okay, so this is for... Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is like coal plants and industrial plants that produce lots of carbon, they're saying, like, why don't you no, just capture so. it at smokestack and bury it. Um, and, you know, I don't know about the industrial folks. I mean, I, I, you know, the thing about industrial folks in the U.S., which I just find to be weird, is that carbon dioxide actually equals waste for them, right? In fact, it, the more efficient their processes are, the less carbon dioxide they're going to produce. But in the U.S., for some reason, we are just god-awful at, at doing that work. I mean... Whereas in Germany, like their, their efficiencies of their industrial processes are at least double our efficiencies of our processes. Not true for like Dow and DuPont and those guys, but for most of our industrial customers, it's just it's fascinating to me how they save all this money by just being more efficient. And they don't seem to invest a lot in being efficient. So, I mean, that's going to be better for them probably. If, uh, if you were a young graduate student in, right now, what part of the industry, uh, energy industry would you go to Besides solar. Oh, well, I mean, there's lots of places besides solar. This is mechanical engineering? Yeah, not just for me. I'm just saying, like, where do you see the biggest growth? But in engineering in or any graduate student? Any graduate student. Well, I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. I, I, what I would say is that for every single person in this room, I don't really care what you want to do. There is a place for you to, to align yourself with sustainability. I mean, if you're a huge fan of you know, land management, and, you know, those kind of things, those, that's easy, right? I mean, if you're a huge fan of, um, like, you know, space and, and, you know, all of those, like, sort of advanced engineering uh, perspectives and stuff, there's lots of work to do with advanced materials and a lot of those other areas. I mean, there's, there's I, I can't even imagine a single person who <coughs> couldn't get a better job and a better career. I mean, how many people in this room think that you're going to have a better career working in the fossil fuel industry as a graduate now compared to a, the sustainability industry over the next 40 years. I mean, like, I mean, it's just like, it's just a non-starter. I mean, if you look at, if you look at Fuqua, like, the, the, the highest job placement rates are the people who have dual degrees here, right, within, you know, both areas, right? And so, so it's like, you know, why? Because people are devoid of this knowledge. It's amazing to me. There are people who are really well-meaning, well-intentioned folks in, 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 in you know, industry that have been working there for 35 years and fantastic people. I mean, salt of the earth, great guys or women, but they just can't fathom that we are in a, in a land of resource constraints. Right? I mean, we've always been a land of resource constraints, but for the last 35 years, no, people have told us that we're not in a land of resource constraints. So then they refuse to believe it, and so they don't plan based on resource constraints. They plan based on infinite resources, right? It's always going to happen, and that's why those industrial customers have like such inefficient systems because they they don't they, they just think that oh natural gas prices will go back down and you know we'll be okay or whatever else, and it didn't matter to spend the capex up front to be more efficient. And so, I. I can't, I really can't think of a single person, I don't care what it is, accounting, marketing, sales, communications, you know, like engineering, I can't imagine a single person that wouldn't be better off working in some job that's going to actually give them a 40-year career versus, you know, a shorter one.
Right, sir, one, just one more question. I know that uh, 8 o'clock now, and he hasn't had a chance to eat dinner yet, as I'm sure. A lot no of worries. Yet, so. All right. There's still well, two more. There's two that just want to right. go for it. Go for it. Me. Okay. Um, so I guess because we only have two more questions, we'll do the bigger topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like it, so I've got like a 10 minute answer now. All right. So, <laughs> so what do we do about deforestation in terms of sucking down carbon? You know, it's a significant amount of the. Um, carbon going up, you know, how do you stop the trees in Borneo from going down and the trees in the Amazon from going down? Where, where do you see that going? So um, yeah, there's two parts to this answer. Like one is the carbon war room is not the elixir for all ills, right? So, <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so that, that's a hard one, right? And so I'm on the board of Greenpeace USA and I mean, they do extraordinary work in Brazil. I mean, I mean, the level of work that they've done to like, you know, stop the cattle farmers from, from deforesting and like actually reserving whole, you know, swaths of land and then actually protecting it and actually using Google Maps to figure out whether it's actually uh, being protected or whether someone's deforesting and stuff. And it's pretty impressive. And, and those guys have to exist. I mean, they have to do what they do. Um, for us, what we do in deforestation is look for models that don't really depend on red, right? Not that we're anti-red, it's just, you know, that's our job is to figure out stuff that's on the left side of the cost curve. So some of the things that are out there is, for instance, um, cattle farming in, in Brazil, they have, um, it, it really can only grow like one head of cattle per hectare um, because the grasses are so poor and the species that they're using are so bad. Um, if they use a different species, it, it takes only three years to go to full growth instead of four years, which saves one year of carbon. Um, and they can get, and if they use different species of grass, it's like three to four um, head per hectare. And right now, the Brazilians are trying to triple the amount of beef that they're actually producing to ship it all to China, which is, is scary in and of itself. And so, um, and so that um, that's a way you could do it. It's eight hundred dollars per uh, eight hundred, not eight hundred. What's what's the currency in Brazil? Real yeah. or something? So so it's eight hundred real to to or nine hundred real to to upgrade the grasses and the species. And the rate of return is off the charts in terms of increased beef production and all this stuff. So you're working with people like JVG, which is like the big Brazilian company, um, and they buy from all these small cattle ranchers. And they can actually make it clear to them, like, look, if you don't do this, this, and this, we're not going to buy from you anymore. And people like Greenpeace and stuff are on their ass already to make sure that they actually comply. So you can imagine that there's enough trust in that circle the private capital could come in. That's the biggest problem in deforestation is that nobody trusts anybody. I mean, Norway's got all this money they've supposedly given the Brazilians and supposedly given Guyana, but they haven't got a check because they don't trust that they, it's permanent, right? So it's not, it's not really where we're going to be strongest, but there are lots of things we can do. It seems like uh, India's turning into a really hot market for solar, the National Solar Mission, and yeah. they want to grow to 20 gigawatts in the next 10 years. Yeah, it'll grow faster. Okay, so just a question on whether you think that's viable, that's going to happen. Yeah, well, it's definitely viable, and it's definitely going to happen. I mean, if you, if you, if you do the 20,000 megawatts across the Indian grid, it's about a 0.4% rate increase across the entire um, grid for all the rate pairs. So, I mean, if you ask people in India, if you had 20,000 megawatts of additional power, would you actually pay a 0.4% rate increase? They'd all say yes. If you actually accelerate it by, to 2015, it's like a... 1% rate increase because, you know, you're paying for slightly more expensive solar because it gets cheaper over time. So it's still a damn good deal. I mean, the, the, the coal power plants are coming in way above. I don't know if you've, you know, watched the headlines in the last week with Anil Ambani's, you know, power, power group, which he, you know, sort of sold during the go-go days like a year and a half ago. And he raised like $1.8 billion. He's already blown through. He's like $500 million left. He's not going to build the coal plants that he has, you know, he has um, concessions for. And so... All that stuff's going up in India. Everything's more expensive. Everything's great. And so, like, the the, the solar stuff is going to take off like crazy. The, the, the biggest problem in solar right now in India is that the, there isn't a market maker in India for project finance. So there's all these people who are, like, 32 years old who are part of some big family who gone to their chief minister and said, hey, give me a 5 megawatt allocation. And they've got the 5 megawatt allocation, and they haven't actually bribed anybody or anything. They just use their family name. But then they went to their father, and their father's like, hell no, I'm not going to give you any money for that. And so then they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do project finance. I don't know how to do construction finance. I don't have any money on my own. And so, you know, companies like mine, my old one, Sun Edison, is building lots of solar there. And 
they're helping all those people out. And there's other people looking at advanced financial infrastructures through OPIC and Export Info Bank and others. And so it'll take about a year or so, I think, to figure all those financial structures out. And once that happens, and it's not just there. Once they figure it out there, they'll export them immediately to South Africa and Uganda and Thailand and all the other places that are doing the same thing. So it'll be it'll be fun to watch. A lot of money to be made. Cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.